Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Welcome back to Plain Spoken. I'm Derek Fournier, your host, and this week's podcast is about building a customer-centric business. I will warn you, while I've tried to use slides in most of these podcasts that I've been doing on the bi-weekly uh, cadence to keep myself sort of on topic, because I have a tendency to drift and use 10,000 words when 100 would suffice, this particular topic is particularly rife with risk for this, because I am a, uh, a zealot, let's say, when it comes to being customer-centric. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it sounds like a platitude. Everyone cares about their customers. And yeah, everyone cares about their customers in so much as that their customers pay them, generally speaking. But businesses that truly transcend have an almost religious zeal about caring about their customers. There's a focus, and sometimes it is sort of over the top and obvious, and sometimes it's subtle and nuanced and and almost beautiful in its simplicity. But if you're running a business and you are not sort of a commodity business. You're not shipping millions of widgets to someone. And even then I would argue this this matters there, but it may be a little bit less. One of the superpowers you can impart to your business and that your employees can make part of the DNA of your business is this customer centricity. So we're going to be talking about some of the core building blocks of that. The basic blocking and tackling is the phrase I often use to describe it uh, that I think go into that. Um, and and how you can implement those in your own organization. So I'm going to pull the slides up to try and keep me aligned. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see the slides. If you're listening on the podcast, you won't see them, but you can always check those out on our YouTube channel, and all of that is in the post on our website. The, uh, the agenda for this particular podcast is about, first, you've got to start by understanding your customers. And if, if I was better at uh, post-production work and having a B-roll and things like that, I would have the scene from Starship Troopers, a classic, uh, to beat the bug first, you must understand the bug. You've got to understand your customers. You have to understand what they want. And this is true irrespective of your business maturation position, right? So founders, this is an area where oftentimes us propeller heads, and I happen to put myself into that bucket, We'll get really, really interested in the product's features and not the benefits. And we'll we'll take this sort of if you build it, they will come attitude rather than going and actually talking to the customers. So it, it really starts first with understanding your customers. Uh, then you have to actually deliver that exceptional service, whatever that happens to be. And, and the way these bullets are aligned, I've got empowering employees last. As soon as employees become a thing beyond employee zero, meaning the founder, you really have to start with this empowerment thing. And I won't belabor the point on this podcast, but until you make this concept of customer centricity part of that that business DNA that you have, until that becomes like breathing, you're never really going to get there. You're going to get pieces and parts, but you won't really arrive. So so at any rate, the second bullet is uh, delivering that exceptional customer service. We'll talk about some examples of folks who have done that. Personalizing the experience. One of the ways you can actually be customer centric is for customers to think you actually give a shit about them. And to, to convey that, you have to really get to know who they are, what they care about, what drives them, what matters to them. And sometimes that's easy to do because you're a small sort of mom and pop operation and you can you can just know them. They're the people you went to church with or to school with, whatever the case may be. But as you scale up those businesses, this becomes more complicated. Now, fortunately, uh, technology has endeavored to give us access to this data and, and access to this data has become a hotly contested issue. But we'll talk about how important personalizing the experience is. Then gathering and acting on feedback, right? So it's one thing to understand your customer or to assert an understanding of your customer. 
right? That's just an instance in time. Then you're going to go try and deliver that experience based on your understanding of the customer. You're going to personalize it as best you can. But this is the, the part of the flywheel where you have to measure, rinse, repeat. So then you go check to see, did I land it? I, I thought I understood you to mean A, B, and C. I delivered A, B, and C. And then as I find out when I turn back and I, and I ask for feedback, you really wanted X, Y, and Z. If you're not doing those cross checks to making, and making sure that your understanding is accurate, then you're going to paint yourself into a corner you don't want to be in. And the final bullet uh, on, this, on this slide deck is the empowering employees, which I will probably spend an inordinate amount of time on. But let's start with understanding your customers. Why does it matter? We talked a little bit in the intro about how critical it is for customers to think you care. Uh, by caring, you can make sure that whatever product or service you deliver is actually on target for what they need. And you can make sure that any of your marketing and sales activities are consistent with that approach. Uh, as someone who has spent a lot of my life in product engineering, understanding your customers, and in fact, sort of dry running your products before you even have a product makes a lot of sense. Now, this will absolutely invoke the argument about, you know, no one asked, uh, what was it? No one asked Edison to invite, uh, invent the light bulb is the phrase that my friend Bill Anderson used to use all the time. Are you evolutionary or revolutionary? We could talk about that for hours and even more hours over some Jameson. But the reality is if you're starting up a company or you're, you're coming into a new company or you're looking at where your services or products are consumed, I happen to think it's imperative that you go talk to the customers who are currently consuming them. They are the ones who are making the decision to change their currency for your stuff. And that matters. In fact, I joke around about price theory and apologies to any of our price theory uh, higher education folks who have incredible tomes that represent how to set pricing because I usually water it down or boil it down to uh, price is what someone will pay for something. And so that conveyance or that, that exchange of currency for your product and service is defined by how well you actually hit the mark on what your customers need. Now, how can you how can you do this? What methods can you use? And in the deck, we talk about the sort of basic stuff like surveys and focus groups and data analytics. Uh, I was talking with a, a client today and he's, he's a young founder. He's got a new product he's trying to bring to market. Uh, and, and when you have that luxury, I happen to think talking to them matters. Now, all of those are forms of communication, surveys and, and focus groups and, and data analytics. But that true dialogue, being able to get in there and have human conversation and understand what it is that's driving your customers is so valuable. If you get a chance to do it, do it. When I was at Microsoft and we completely screwed the pooch on SMS 2.0 and then completely screwed the pooch on 2.0 SP1, we went out and talked to customers. We went and experienced, felt, were sworn at about their pain and slowly started the climb out of that abyss to SP2, which has continued on to make that product a, a multi-billion dollar product. Now, that doesn't always scale. So sometimes you've got to use tools that allow yourself to scale. There are great companies out there. You can start basic, like with SurveyMonkey and other survey tools. Those can become uh, impersonal, and I would caution uh, against doing too much of that. Uh, so I would say quality over quantity, especially as you're, as you're growing growing your company. Now, a good example of this, and I've got Amazon highlighted here. I don't know anyone who doesn't use the hell out of Amazon. They have the ability to use a ton of data from all of us. I shudder to think how much crap uh, my wife and I buy from Amazon. Uh, and certainly we can throw in buzzwords like machine learning and AI to figure out what's going on and make personalized recommendations. But you've got to control that dial, right? It's dial, not a switch. And I have recently become a little annoyed by Amazon sending me messages uh, on my phone. Hey, we found this perfect product for you. Listen, I, I understand what you're doing, but you've got to figure out what the right amount of sort of proactive outreach you do. Uh, I tend to think this is more of a reactive, and then you've got to slowly turn the dial on proactive. Understanding buying patterns is important. Um, but I would, I would be cautious there. But generally speaking, the fact that Amazon knows what we buy, how we buy, can make intelligent recommendations is a superpower. And because they have such access to data, uh, it's a great opportunity for them. And it's a great experience for us as customers. Probably one of the reasons why I would suspect we pay 15% more for a lot of this stuff that we buy from Amazon. 
they have reduced the friction to purchase to almost zero, with the exception being that I have to give them my currency, which sometimes I'm not a fan of doing. But by God, when I know I can have it here in two hours, that is almost miraculous. The next piece is on delivering exceptional customer service. Um, and there's all sorts of examples of this, and it should be immediately obvious why this is important. Uh, I just talked about proactive. The ability to anticipate customer needs is different than the desire to sell them something they don't know they want. They're both powerful. And so you've got to be cautious about which one you choose to implement. But like I said, I, I tend to, to start with looking backwards and making sure that they're taken care of, right? So that goes to quick response times. If there is a problem, how do you respond? Uh, how do you resolve the issue? And we've all had these experiences. I had a, what the hell are they, a little frother for coffee and creamer. It wasn't expensive. It was like $10, $11, something like that off of Amazon, somewhat coincidentally. Uh, and it just stopped working for reasons uh, I don't understand. Maybe because it's shitty and cheap. Immediately went in there to the company website because it was outside of the 90 days or whatever Amazon would take care of this. Put in a help desk ticket. They immediately wrote back, sent me a new one. No questions asked. It was great. I bought four more of them. They just seemed to break after a year. And at some point I learned my lesson. But my experience with the company was positive because they handled it so well. Uh, it used to be the case. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, when we talk about returns. Um, uh, in fact, we talk about it here with Nordstrom. Costco used to be that way. It used to be if you bought something at Costco, if you had any issue, you just went back to Costco. You didn't have to worry about it. You didn't have to worry about who had the warranty. Do I have to go to the manufacturer? Do I have to you know, deal with a website? You had one throat to choke, one person to speak to, and that was a really, really powerful way for work to get done. Uh, by establishing that, by establishing that exceptional customer service, you create a relationship with your customer. Not only are they thankful that you do it, but they're more likely to become a repeat customer if that's something that can be done. I, I mentioned Nordstrom. Uh, I don't shop in Nordstrom often, but they are regaled or we are regaled with stories of how Nordstrom takes care of their, their clients. Uh, and, and that seems to be true. Apple, who I am uh, reticent to say anything good about because of my Microsoft lineage, but I have to acknowledge it because we use Apple devices in development. The Apple Store concept is incredibly well executed, or it has been historically. I haven't been in there recently, and as I understand it, that sort of dropped off a little bit. But the ability to go in there and have someone who's truly knowledgeable help you with what is a non-trivial purchase. You're not just buying a $200 object. These are $1,000 objects. Putting that extra layer of support allowed them to expand their demographics, and expand their market, and really did great things for Apple. Microsoft tried to jump in and do it, and we did just an absolute crap job. Personalizing the experience, you guys know if you've listened to this podcast, is something that I really, really can get excited about. And personalization takes advantage of knowledge of your customer to really create a bespoke experience. Uh, what that does is it drives loyalty uh, and, it, and it increases sales because as you learn more about the customer, you can adjust your products and services to make sure that you're offering them the things that they want more of and deprecating the things that they don't want. Now, this is an area where technology can be super, super powerful. Uh, CRM is brought into the discussion from time to time. And yes, CRM is important. I tend to, to speak uh, down to CRM, which is probably not fair. Uh, I just, I, I haven't in my experience, and I'd love to hear your experience if you've had different, better uh, sexier experience with CRM, people end up just storing a bunch of data and it becomes an untended garden. That said, if you're using CRM properly and you're storing information, or if you have systems that integrate with CRM so that the information you learn about your customer is retained there and can be leveraged, then that's super powerful. Again, artificial intelligence and real-time data analytics can come in and show trends across multiple customers. And if you're a big company, those trends can be like a, a meta-analysis that allow you to do road mapping and really powerful things around your product stack. Uh, I am a Starbucks guy. My time in Seattle did, in fact, uh, cause me to become mildly addicted to coffee. Some of you would say burnt coffee uh, in the case of Starbucks because you're probably Dunkin' Friends. But their mobile app, early days, was super powerful. I still find it to be powerful. It's just not as great a deal for the user. 
right? They take my money and they get to make interest uh, ostensibly on my money. And I use their magical Starbucks currency and every once in a while I get a free thing. But what they've given me is what the incentive is, is the ease of use. Now, the fact that Symbol Engineers managed to screw up almost every Starbucks building in sight, making the driveway drive throughs almost impassable and the parking lots a zoo does in some ways diminish this. But the fact that I know when I'm traveling down south to see my clients uh, down in the Miami area, I know I'm going to swing by a Starbucks in Bartow. I know that I need to put in my order as I'm passing the phosphate mines. and It's going to be ready when I walk in and can pick it up. That is an incredible service. Now, there's a whole nother podcast about how you integrate that into the operations of the individual Starbucks so that the mobile orders don't supersede the in-store orders and cause discord, but that's a topic for another day. Another good example of this that many of us have experienced is Spotify with our personalized playlists. I use the silly DJ feature more often than I thought I would. Uh, being able to have a DJ that just plays based on my preferences is a really cool feature. It's simple, but it personalizes it. Now, for Spotify, it hasn't led me to buy any more stuff, whereas Starbucks, knowing my normal order is uh, sous vide egg bites and a venti white chocolate mocha with oat milk and no whip, allows me to easily purchase that and they can make recommendations off of that that I might like. So going and creating that collection of data in a way that makes my purchase seamless or frictionless or reduces the friction, you're never going to get the total friction free there. Uh, and then can slowly but surely allow a customer or a business to turn the dial and make informed recommendations that delight the customer, that, that you, you evoke the response, which is, oh, man, I would like that. I, I'm glad you, you brought that up. I was not thinking of uh, adding a bottle of water. What a terrible example that is. But I was not thinking of adding this additional thing to my stack. Um, I will go on a slight diatribe here because I posted a quick video on my LinkedIn page. It's also in the YouTube. I should probably cross in the YouTube. Good Lord, sounded like my dad there. In our YouTube channel, it's posted. Uh, I had a great experience with the Walmart app the other day. Um, if you haven't seen the video, the TLDV of that, which I can't believe I just dropped because I hate it. Because if you don't have time to view a two minute video, what the hell are you doing with your life? But to get pickup, you either had to order $35 worth of stuff or pay a $7 fee. I had no issue with that. I immediately bought more stuff and I was happy about it because their experience to pick stuff up is so good. So the app was great to use. The experience was fine. I had no issue understanding the business need for them to charge if I bought one damn thing and then I was going to go pick it up and they had to have someone pull the order, bring it out. There's all sorts of costs associated with that. It was a great experience for me. And now I know, and I bought, instead of two items, I bought seven items. Win-win, personalized experience was a great experience for me as a consumer. Gathering and acting on feedback. So again, I, you know, I, I kind of kind of bristled when I talked about surveys, but you've got to use your customer feedback to refine your products and services. You will not stick every landing. You will not successfully guess everything that a customer could want. You will not certainly guess the perfect way to implement anything. So going in and finding a way to connect to the voice of your customer, uh, whether it's high touch, low scale, or high scale, low touch, some combination thereof is an incredibly powerful thing. Now, garbage in, garbage out. If you're out there just looking at the app score, and assume, well, our app is really good because it has a high app score, or our app is a big piece of shit because it's got a low app score, you're being intellectually lazy and you really need to figure out how to collect data that's meaningful. But if you do so with good faith and go and collect this data, your business will thrive. It does build trust because you are demonstrating the value of what your customers are saying and taking that input to actually make a difference. Again, I'll, I'll rewind back to my Microsoft days. That was one of the most powerful psychological pieces of what we called our early adopter program was that the customers who were committed to us, we spent time with, we provided a, a platform for, we gave them a voice. They were able to actually help craft the roadmap of the product. And because of that, they were willing to fight with us 
not only with us when we were wrong or when they disagreed, but with us side by side, if the industry pushed back against us, with us, if customers griped about the way we implemented something, because we didn't just go off onto an ivory tower and then come down with the, the tablets that represented our next product. We actually consulted customers who use the product. That is so powerful when you can say that, creating customer advisory panels or boards and actually involving them, spending the time to ask someone how they enjoyed the coffee that you made for them. This is not wasted time. Gather that feedback. Now, ideally, don't write it on a slip of paper, put it in a little bucket, and then hope you go back and read it. Implement systems that can be leveraged to, to collect, collate, and use that feedback for the massive amount of good that it can represent. Now, some of the examples that we have on the slide, Lego is notorious for using the customer feedback to influ influence future designs. Uh, Lego is doing a lot of stuff right, folks. Um, when I was growing up, Legos weren't a thing. We had blocks or bricks, and you sure as hell didn't buy them in the shape of the Millennium Falcon or a Death Star. You bought a bucket of them, and then you built things that were vaguely square. Come to think of it, it was sort of like a physical plastic version of Minecraft, which we really wanted to get past and create photorealistic uh, simulations of. And then we immediately went back to 8-bit uh, graphics. But I digress. Lego is doing a lot right. They definitely take that feedback, and they have created a massive empire uh, out of that. Dell, and I talked about Dell in a previous uh, podcast, had this idea storm platform. Any of these platforms that take customer feedback, aggregate them, and provide analytics are useful if used properly. Uh, I have a friend who works at Qualetrics. That's really at the heart of what they do. They're using AI to, to provide meaningful uh, sort of analysis of this massive amount of data. Uh, I, I don't have a clue at how deep Qualitrix is, but I know that they are incredibly successful at this. Uh, and so if you're a large company, that's someone you should probably look at, uh, look at involving, not sponsored. I just know the people that are there and I know they're smart. Uh, this comes with the same caveat that my slight diatribe about the App Store rating will come with. When you collect this data, make sure the data leads you to actionable results. If it doesn't, adjust what you're collecting. Don't bother people to give you feedback that you can't take action on. That's just annoying. And they're going to sit there and go, why the hell did I give you that feedback? It has made no difference whatsoever in what we do or how we do it. So make sure that you understand what you're trying to find out. Go get it in a way that is easy, simple, and then actually act on it. If you keep asking people what they want and still never deliver, people are going to eventually get pissed off. Now, what's funny is the, the tool that I use for this podcast is a, a tool called StreamYard. Many people use it. I lamented for the first four months or whatever that I've been doing this, that a product that does video capture, which this does, which is how we put these podcasts in video format on our YouTube channel, needs to have a dark mode because many people like myself use a giant screen there is so much white, it made lighting almost impossible to manage, at least for someone who is not a production-centric person like myself. I went out and found a plugin called Darkify that essentially creates a dark mode for any website as best it could. But when I loaded StreamYard today, guess what they implemented? Dark mode. It was a piece of feedback I gave. I'm sure it was just because I gave them the feedback. No, it was, I assume it was more than just me. But that's another example of a company hearing from their users and going, oh, Got it. This sucks. Let's fix it. There are a number of other features they released. Uh, I'm not sure how beneficial they all are, but I know that one I liked because now I don't have to use that plugin and I had my dark mode. So really good stuff there. Last but certainly not least, empowering employees. How do you do this business-centric thing at scale? Well, you sure as hell don't do it with one person. It doesn't get done because the CEO or the president or the founder really cares about customers, and that's it. It it has to start there. But what it has to be, and I prattled on about it early in this podcast, it has to become part of your DNA. Now, the examples we have for this on the slide, for those of you on, on YouTube, are Ritz-Carlton and Zappos. Uh, I think everyone who's bought anything from Zappos knows how incredible they are. They've heard the story of 
Zappos sending out four different sizes to someone and then having them send back the sizes that don't fit. Uh, giving your employees the latitude to do what is right, to provide that incredible customer service because you don't have to make your entire win on one purchase. You're building a relationship with a customer ideally for life. And in fact, ideally as we would say in Polk County, with all of their friends and family. You make that one experience so great that even if you, because of the time you spend or the extra product you send that has to be sent back, that drives your cost of goods up so that your margin goes down on that transaction, it's so good that you create 10 other transactions that wouldn't have existed. Now, no one will ever be able to go back and recapture that and roll it back against marketing or whatever the right thing to do is. My friend Joe, the the CFO with the mostest would tell me how to do this. But when you empower your employees to do that, every employee becomes a chief marketing officer for your, for your brand, for your product, for your service. When that happens, you have created a superpower. Now, you've got to train them to do this. You've got to provide some guardrails, right? Um, but giving your employees authority to make intelligent decisions on the spot without having to well, let me talk to my manager who will talk to their manager who will talk to their manager and creating incredible tax can become a true superpower for your organization. Now, the reason I mentioned at the beginning that this would normally be further up is because this is the replication of the spirit of your company. If you're going to build a, biz, a, a customer-centric business, everyone in your organization needs to understand that that's what you're doing. It has to become almost like religious zeal that you carry forth. That doesn't mean that the customer is always right. It does mean that the customer is always the customer. And their feedback needs to be collected, weighed, evaluated, and responded to. Even if the response is, I appreciate this feedback, but I think there may be a misunderstanding. When you communicate with trust and with authenticity, you create relationships that last a lifetime. And that's what really is the heart of building a customer-centric business. It can be done at scale. It has been done at scale. It's easier to do small. Guess what? That's true about almost everything. But it doesn't mean you can't do it if you have a million customers. It just means it takes a little bit more work, a little different work, different systems. But it is an incredible journey if you're willing to embark on it. And I really do encourage you to do so. So... That's, that's this episode on building a customer-centric business. As, as should be obvious by my tone, this is something that I am incredibly passionate about. Uh, I can get excited about almost any kind of product. And if you, in whatever product you sell or whatever service you deliver, are not excited about it to the point where you want to make sure whatever customer you sell that to is incredibly happy with it, then, then I would encourage you to find something else to do. Right? This isn't one of those platitudes of, you know, find something you love and you never work another day in your life. But if you haven't found the thing that you're so excited about that you want everyone to be able to use it or everyone who needs it to use it, and you as a founder or as a leader can't spread that to the rest of your organization, then you need to evaluate that. There are plenty of businesses out there that do commodity level stuff that aren't super exciting to me. But I have to believe from the outside looking in, the people inside those walls really, really care. And at the base of all of this customer centricity is care, compassion, and passion. So at any rate, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Plain Spoken. I, I enjoy this topic immensely. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please let me know. Let's get some integration or some interaction rather with the podcast. Share it with your friends. I hope that uh, they will enjoy it as well. We'll be back in two weeks with another topic. As always, you can find our materials on plainsight.net. But until next time, I'm Derek signing off and thanks for joining. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show, found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. 
Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, 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 what